My name is Alyssa Dixon. Um, I'm the teen services person here at the Wilkinson. Um, and a lot of folks were involved in planning this evening, and we're all really, really excited. I hope you guys are too. Um, and I hope you guys enjoyed the food. It was delicious. Thanks to Shanghai Palace for the ride back. So obviously we, uh, in standard Telluride form, are running a little bit behind schedule. Um, so, you know, Craig Charles will just start a little bit later, but we'll still go on. And what I want to do now is go ahead and introduce our first presentation of the night, which I had the privilege to see a version of at the school today. So um, Bruce and Tass were doing presentations at the school all day, K through 12. Um, kids of all ages got to see their pieces. At the school today, they did the Middle East, which was really nice, which was really neat. Tonight, they're going to do their presentation on the place they just visited, which was their big bike trip across China. Um, and so I hope you guys all enjoy it. I loved it today. Thank you. The program we'd like to share with you this evening is called Land of the Dragon. It's the story of our three and a half month bicycle trip across China last summer. We chose the dragon word in the title because dragons are considered to be good luck in China, and we saw them everywhere in the artwork, in uh, statues, paintings, and in even just different signs for businesses. We chose China because we think China is becoming so important in our world. It's important economically, politically, and socially, and I think we're just going to hear more and more about it. So we thought it would be good for us to go there, to experience it, come back, and then be able to create programs so that we could help everybody else come along on trying to understand what's going on in China. Normally, it's just Bruce, it's just one of us that does the show, but whenever we do a public show, we'll sometimes take turns with the narration. So that way, that means tonight you get to hear both sides of the story. <laughs> so I'm gonna turn it over to Bruce and he'll get it started. Um, first of all, I wanna thank uh, everybody in uh, Telluride, the library, and everybody who helped uh, bring us in. It's really fun and exciting to be here. It's a wonderful town. And we've only been here once before, so we hope uh, that we'll get a chance to come back soon. So thanks for having us. And we're just going to go ahead and get started. If we can get the lights down. Tass and I have created a series of slideshows about our travels. We call Images of the World. We've done many different adventures together. Our longest trip, our Around the World bicycle trip, took us over two years. Tass and I have also cycled through Central America and Mexico. We have a show on volcanoes of the world. We bicycled in South America through Southern Africa. The school kids saw our Mummies and Moss show on the Mideast. But tonight, you're going to see Land of the Dragon. The People's Republic of China is on the continent of Asia. It's about the same size as the United States. There are 22 provinces in China in light brown, five autonomous regions in dark brown, four controlled municipalities in bright red. You can see the route we're going to be taking through the country. 14 other countries surround China. China stretches across five time zones, yet the entire country is on the same time as the capital of Beijing. <laughs> This is a physical map of China. We're going to start out in the south. It's going to be hot and tropical with monsoon rains. Western China has many mountains more than 20,000 feet in height. Mount Everest, the highest mountain in the world, is right on the border of China and Nepal. Northern China, the Gobi Desert, the Taklamakan Desert. China has some of the most beautiful modern cities in the world with some of the most amazing architecture. The Bird's Nest Sports Stadium was built for the 2008 Beijing Olympics. The water cube nearby was built for the swimming venue. It's designed to look like soap bubbles. There are more than 4,000 of those bubbles, some 30 feet wide, spread across the outside of the building. This building has an unusual nickname. It's called Big Pants. <laughs> because of all the construction in China, China uses more coal, steel, and concrete than any other country in the world. Walking down the sidewalks in Beijing, we often saw models out in photo shoots, so we would just join in and make photos. One of the goals of our trip is to document the rapidly changing lifestyle that is modern China. Tiananmen Square is the world's largest public square. There we go. It can hold more than a million people. But there are 1.4 billion people in China, the world's most populous country. 92% of the people in China belong to the Han ethnic group. 
They're the largest ethnic group in the world. But there are 55 different minority groups in China with their own customs, traditions, and food and clothing. We're going to visit a number of those different minority groups as we travel across China. This family is having their portrait taken in front of the Chairman Mao picture. He is still revered today for bringing the Communist Party to power more than 70 years ago. Unfortunately, some of Mao's ideas were a disaster for the country. In the 1950s, Mao thought the U.S. and the Soviet Union were going to attack China. Chinese factories along the coast seem especially vulnerable to attack. The great leap forward was Mao's plan to spread those factories through the countryside. But there was no infrastructure to bring energy or raw materials to the factories. Peasants burned wagons and furniture for fuel. They melted farm tools and cooking pots to meet metal production quotas. As a result, it's an estimated 45 million people died from starvation. In 1966, Mao started the Cultural Revolution to eliminate the four olds, old customs, old ideas, old habits, and old, what was the fourth one? Uh, culture, habits, and customs. There they are right there. A frenzy of destruction swept across China. <laughs> Teachers, doctors, and lawyers were forced to do manual labor in the countryside. Many of the old, beautiful buildings were destroyed, along with middle class and upper class homes. Mao died in 1976, and Deng Xiaoping took over the country. He opened up China to foreign investment. That has allowed China to become the, one of the fastest growing economies in the world. China is also one of the oldest civilizations in the world. It's divided into, their history is divided into the different periods called dynasties. The rulers were called emperors. The first emperor lived more than 2,000 years ago, and he created the terracotta army, soldiers made out of clay that were all found buried underground. Most of the emperors lived in the Forbidden City, a palace so big it contained 9,999 rooms. If a newborn prince, stayed in a different room every day of his life, he would be 27 years old by the time he had slept in each room in the Forbidden City. <coughs> this is a painting of Kublai Khan. He's the grandson of Genghis Khan, fierce warriors from Mongolia. Kublai Khan invaded and then ruled China about 700 years ago. The Great Wall was created to keep warriors like Kublai Khan out of China. There's not just one wall, though. There's many walls built throughout northern China over a, a period of almost 2,000 years. There was no master plan, though. Each emperor just built a section of wall wherever they thought the threat of Mongol invasion was going to be the greatest. Our goal was to bike across China to the Gobi Desert, where the oldest section of the Great Wall was constructed almost 1,600 years earlier than the section Bruce is hiking on right here. But to get started, we're going to pass through Hong Kong, an ultra-modern, ultra-hip, happening city with incredible mass transit. People living in Hong Kong take shopping to an all-new level. <coughs> We brought our bikes and equipment with us, so we were very excited to begin our cycling adventure. We started biking in one of the poorest regions in China, so we were quite surprised to see so much construction. There was a ton of traffic on the road, and yet almost everybody would swerve and give us plenty of room. We first visit a traditional village that is home to an ethnic group with an unusual name. They are called Miao, and it's spelled M-I-A-O. Busloads of Han, Han Chinese tourists also visit the village. That helps pour money into the local economy and really helps preserve the traditional lifestyle. During festivals, the Miao women wear big headdresses out of silver and the same for their necklaces. I think she's telling me she's four years old. <laughs> the everyday dress of the Miao women is also quite distinct. She's cooking some noodles, which are eaten for breakfast, lunch, and supper. 
The goal seems to be to eat as quickly as possible. <laughs> even very young kids learn to use chopsticks, and they're even used for eating breakfast. A game of Chinese jump rope. <laughs> Many of the roads we were cycling were in pretty bad shape. So as a result, the Chinese government is now building a massive highway system. These elevated highways are being built throughout the country. There are hundreds of feet in many places in the air. And when the road comes into the mountains, they build hundreds of tunnels. Some of the tunnels are over two miles long. We ride through many small towns that aren't on any of our maps. We did have three maps on the trip, and they didn't always agree on roads or towns. But in China, a small town usually means a quarter to a half a million people. All the scaffolding on the side of the building is made of bamboo. We visit a traditional village that is home to an ethnic group called the Yao, Y-A-O. Each of those huge buildings is a single family's home. We stayed with the Yao family. They had an altar up with pictures of the ancestors. They prayed to the ancestors for health and prosperity. Right next to the altar, the dad was watching an NBA basketball game on TV, which is wildly popular in China. But the rest of the house had hardly any furniture. The Yao women in this area call themselves the long hairs, and they were happy to demonstrate the long hair technique. A couple seconds later, all finished. It seemed like everybody in China has a cell phone. I met these two Yao women out on the trail. They sold me the hat and the scarf that I'm wearing. They kept pinching me on the bottom, which is how Yao women show their affection towards men. <laughs> We're going to spend three days hiking through an area called the Dragon's Backbone Rice Terraces. Plant rice, of course, the fields all have to be flooded, and so they first plow the fields. If you look close, this man is using a horse. They often use oxen. It's actually very difficult work. Over half the people in China still live in the countryside, although that number is dropping rapidly. Less than 14% of the land in China is suitable for cultivation. Here in the United States, 42% of our land is arable. Of that 14% of the land, half is devoted to growing rice. We love the patterns hiking through this area. We thought they were some of the most beautiful hikes we've done anywhere in the world. It also helps with all the rain that we've had here during the monsoon season for our first month. We uh, found ourselves riding across lots of cities, which we actually didn't mind. It was never boring. There's little bike lanes that are now today filled with motorcycles, is how we get across the towns. And we're not the only ones that are carrying big loads. Yeah. Um. <laughs> to say hello in Chinese, you say ni hao. Ni hao. <laughs> Chinese women love shoes. There seem to be four or five shoe stores on every block. They also wear high heels at all times of the day, even when walking long distances, and even when riding their bicycles. <laughs> We're in a, a park in one of the towns. This young boy is looking pair, through a pair of binoculars. I think he'll like what he's looking at. In some of the parks in China, you can find monkeys. These are rhesus macaques. The older macaques, the male macaques, his face turns bright red. Here's a little baby macaque. Now I don't want to know. We've just cycled through Guizhou and Guangxi province. Now we're going to take a quick train ride into Yunnan province and do a big loop through Yunnan. 
Uh, we're now going to be very close to Vietnam, Laos, Thailand, Myanmar, or Burma. India is right over here. The capital of Kunming is often called the city of eternal spring because of its moderate climate up in the mountains. We love going to the parks in these cities to see people dancing. People would come all times of the day to sing and to dance in the park. This group is learning Latin and ballroom dancing. The government encourages people to come to the parks to dance and to exercise to have a healthy lifestyle. Beautiful ornate wooden doors have been carved and painted beautiful colors. They're actually very hard to find. Most of these old doors were destroyed during the Cultural Revolution. We found these doors at a temple built to remember this man. He lived 2,500 years ago. His name, Confucius. He taught morals and philosophy. He taught the importance of knowing the difference between what is right and what is wrong. These are musicians in the Confucian temple. During the, his teachings are very important still to the Chinese today, but during the Cultural Revolution, the government ridiculed his teachings. Today, the Chinese government embraces his teachings in an effort to keep people from converting to Buddhism, Islam, or Christianity. The Chinese government is officially atheist, and to have a government job, you cannot belong to any religious group. China also strongly enforces the one-child policy for any married couples who live in the city. Ethnic minorities and people who live in the countryside are allowed to have more children. But anybody that breaks this law faces huge fines and cannot get a job working with the government. Education in China is free until middle school. Even in elementary school, though, the parents have to pay for books, uniforms, they pay for food, and then heating or air conditioning for the building. Kids go to school six days a week, and they're under huge pressure to get good grades, which will lead to good jobs. Chinese is written using characters or symbols instead of letters of the alphabet. Most elementary age students learn about 3,000 500 characters. When you think about our alphabet and counting to 10, that's a lot of things to memorize. Most adults know about 6,000. She's getting a ride to school with her grandfather. I love that she was reading a book. Most parents bring the kids to school on motor scooters. And frankly, it was unusual to see just one child on a motorcycle. Usually all the friends pile on too. She even has a little girl standing in front of her. She has their backpacks and a basket on the handlebars, and it's hanging with plastic bags full of groceries, all multitasking in her high heels. <laughs> Most elementary school kids have two to three hours of homework every night. So it was very common to see kids sitting outside doing their homework in front of their parents' stores. Most towns had several recycling centers, which were always busy. They recycle everything. The people are paid by the weight of the load. And for many people in China, recycling is a full-time job. Right now, the US and Europe are sending a lot of discarded products to China to be recycled. The Chinese government is working hard on conservation and trying to protect the natural resources. Each region in China had different food with different spices. We also got to try some unusual food. A specialty in this area, fried river moss. It was green, but kind of salty like potato chips. How about spicy fried squid? Another popular Chinese snack Chicken feet. Oh. You just spit the bones on the floor. Too bad we didn't have any of those tonight. No matter where we went, even on roads that weren't on our map, there was still a lot of traffic, most of it for construction. 
There's so much traffic, in fact, the farmers throw their grain out into the road, so when the vehicles go over, they help to thrash it. We're going to leave the area with all of the rice terraces and head a little further into the mountains. I love the pattern of these terraces. One day we cycled from sea level to over 9,000 feet in elevation. I like the pattern here, they were growing tobacco. We're gonna visit the largest weekly market in Yunnan province. It's amazing to see all the different vegetables, many of them we never even had heard of before. I love the pattern, the way everything was very artfully arranged. Chinese cucumbers are about two and a half, three feet long. Umbrellas are often used for protection from the sun. Uh, this woman belongs to the uh, Nakta ethnic group, and you can see her beautiful silver coins here. Um, and these are all little pieces of silver across the top of her hat. So much of the road construction we saw was done by hand. Yes, of course, they have big, huge earth movers, but a lot of the construction was done by people like this. She's got a shovel, and she's loading up uh, uh, sand in the back. This woman has been carrying it. Uh, down to the road construction site. We were very impressed by how hard the Chinese people work. Not just the adults, the young kids as well. After school, this young boy is selling pigs in the local animal market. We never seem to go far without stopping to make a photograph. This dog's ears and tail have been dyed pink. During, during the Cultural Revolution, dogs were banned. They were considered an unnecessary luxury. Today, people in China love to give dogs unusual haircuts. <laughs> we're dropping back down out of the mountains on a very windy road. Uh, we had a flat tire stopped and uh, did a quick tire change. Not long after this photo was taken, we came around a rain slicking corner and there was some oil from a truck that had spilled on the road. Tass hit that oil slick and went down and cracked a couple of her ribs uh, on her bicycle. So she needs a couple of days off. Now she can still walk around and hike and make photos and explore, but um, we definitely slowed down for a few days just to give her a chance to kind of recuperate. We're now in the very southern part of Yunnan province. Now we're very close to the Laos and the Thailand and the Burmese border. And this area just so much reminded us of being in Thailand. The temples are just exactly like the Thai temples. The Chinese call this ethnic group the Dai ethnic group. Young Dai boys often spend a couple of years as junior or apprentice monks. That doesn't mean they can't play basketball <coughs> or shoot pool. Oh, yeah. Well, Tass said that her ribs hurt whether she's bicycling or not. So after a couple of days, she said, well, let's just start bicycling again. So we're going to head up into the mountains very close to the Laos border. We're riding through bamboo forest here. Stopped in a couple very small villages. This is the only store in this village. We love the fact they had a pool table out in the fresh air. We carried a little Mandarin phrase book with us, but Mandarin Chinese is a very difficult language to learn and we really struggled with trying to communicate with the people. Here we think we're at a wedding and we were trying to look up the word for bride and groom and wouldn't you know it, it wasn't even in our dictionary. <laughs> even with the dictionary, it was very difficult to try to translate the road signs. <laughs> we're now visiting another traditional village. This one doesn't have streets. Instead, it has very winding cobblestone paths. For anybody who's been in China, this is the town of Lijiang. These are Han Chinese tourists out in front of the main wall, old city walls. The people who are wearing the colorful costumes are paid to be included in the picture. <coughs> we met Li. She is a member of the Nashi ethnic group. She invited us to spend some time in her village. The Nashi created a hieroglyphic language a thousand years ago, and it is the only pictograph language, a hieroglyphic language, that is still in use today. 
The Nashi have a matrilineal society. What does that mean? Women are the boss. Arguments are settled by a group of female elders. Though in the Nashi language, nouns enhance their meaning if the word for female is added. The word is decreased if the word or the noun is decreased if the word for male is added. For an example, stone plus female is boulder, but stone plus male is pebble. <laughs> Leaving town the next morning, not just heavy truck traffic, but also sometimes herds of animals. The Han Chinese tourists would frequently stop along the road and offer us a lot of encouragement. They also loved making our photographs. Luckily, a cold drizzle that we'd had for quite a while let up just enough for us to set up our tent. We were freezing that night. We're over 13,000 feet in elevation. And we spent the night in the tent talking about all the warm clothes we left behind because they were too heavy. <laughs> These were vegetable fields with their remarkable patterns. A little bit closer. There are four people working in the field right there. Women in the Yi ethnic group wore huge black hats. And we saw this throughout China, where the mother would wear her traditional clothes, but her daughter would prefer a more modern style. Our destination, Shangri-La, is home to an uh, ethnic group called the Tibetans, who mostly live in the mountains. Just like each town we visited, at night there was dancing in the town square, so Bruce would often join in. Getting a few moves going there. This young boy is offering rides on his yak to Han Chinese tourists. Yaks also need to live at a higher altitude. There were hundreds of stores in this area selling Tibetan artwork, fabric, and jewelry. One of the popular foods here was barbecue. We'd just pick out whatever we wanted. They'd quickly grill it up. Let's see, we're gonna have some spicy chicken, tofu, and vegetables, delicious. We were quite amazed to see that this whole valley was being filled with these huge new homes. Those are all for a single family. We spent a day at this Tibetan Buddhist monastery, which was nearly destroyed during the Cultural Revolution. It's being rebuilt and is now home to about 400 monks. The main temple was packed with Chinese tourists, but as soon as we went into the other areas, we were alone with the monks. He invited us to join him for tea. We loved the architecture and the amazing colors. He was doing a little touching up on one of the walls. And to enter the temple, you had to pass by this 30 foot high <laughs> temple guardian carved out of solid sandalwood. It smelled wonderful. We were invited to a Tibetan wedding. Look at the size of the necklaces on the bride and the groom. She has to even hold hers up. It is so heavy. We continued a little further into the mountains, and then we came around a corner, and we saw, what did we see? A police checkpoint a lot like this one. And in the middle of the road, several policemen, a lot like this, only looking way more serious. The road had just been closed to foreigners. Supposedly, people were starting to protest up in the mountains the government, the Chinese government's treatment of the Tibetans. The police do not want foreigners to see or photograph anybody criticizing the government. Unlike here, where criticizing the government is allowed, in China, that is really against the law and the penalties are huge. Well, now we have no choice. We have to throw our bikes in the back of a bus, four days and four nights of bus riding to get around the closed area. We have literally been stopped 
in our tracks. The Chinese word for stop is tin shi. Well, we stop and get off the bus in this city that is one of the most polluted towns we saw in China. However, overlooking this same river is the largest stone sculpture of Buddha in the world. Buddhism is also the largest religion in China, and we're going to join this huge crowd of people to try to get down the staircase of nine turns so we can see more of the statue. We're about halfway down now. The statue is 233 feet high. It's more than 1,000 years old. Finally, we made it to the bottom of the statue. The feet are so big, 10 people can stand on the big toenail. Now, Buddhism is the largest religion in China. However, Christianity is the fastest growing religion in China. There are some old Chinese churches. This one was built by the Jesuits about 400 years ago. We went inside, it was beautiful colors. However, it's really hard to find churches in China. The government tries to discourage people from becoming Christian. So to avoid persecution, many Christians meet secretly in homes and in apartments. We love going again to the beautiful parks. Here's a whole bunch of kids feeding koi. They, many people think it's a type of goldfish. Actually, it's a type of carp, but they have such beautiful colors. They are not eaten in China. They are raised just for decorative purposes. This group is practicing Tai Chi in the park. It's a form of martial art where you move very, very slowly. It's very relaxing and requires excellent balance. Kung Fu means skill, and it refers to all Chinese martial arts, of which there are hundreds. During the Cultural Revolution, many of the best uh, people, instructors in Kung Fu, were either sentenced to prison or sentenced to the countryside, and today, most of the people who are really the experts in Kung Fu no longer live in China. However, many of the world's best gymnasts do still live in China, as you may have remember from this summer's Olympics. Chinese calligraphy is not just writing, but it's considered a form of art. This is written, or this is written with a water brush. He's got a little, well, let's see if he's gonna pop up there. There we go. He's got a little water bottle right here, and it goes into his brush, so that means as the water evaporates, the writing will disappear. Chinese calligraphy, just as important in the way you write is your movement and rhythm as you are writing. And people who are good at, at calligraphy are highly respected in China. Huge crowds will gather around just to watch people writing like this on the sidewalk. We went to the Chinese opera. These are fan dancers. In this part of China, the opera is also famous for its face changing where the performers wear masks and watch closely. The man here with a green mask, without even touching his mask, he just simply lifts his right hand up, and in the blink of an eye, the mask changes without him even touching it. Wow. This man has baskets of pet crickets for sale. <laughs> crickets rub their wings together, which makes a chirping noise that many people in China believe is very calming and soothing. So people will often buy little cages with crickets, they'll hang them in their house, and so every evening they can hear the sound of those chirping crickets. Crickets and worms are also a snack option in China. The Chinese have a saying, they will eat anything with legs except for the table and the chairs. <laughs> Starfish, seahorses, even scorpions on sticks. Oh, lovely. Butterfly chrysalis. And for dessert, popsicles made from peas. I tell you what, I like popsicles and I like peas, but popsicles made from peas, they were, it wasn't exactly the best. But uh, it really was fun for us to try all those different strange foods, but most of it was delicious. Oh, is that me? I think it's you. Oh, it is. There's my bamboo forest. Bamboo is a type of grass. It's one of the fastest growing plants in the world. Some species of bamboo can grow 40 inches in one day. And bamboo forests are the primary habitat for the giant panda. Newborn giant pandas weigh only a couple of ounces and they're about the size of a stick of butter. 
For the first three months, they barely move. Giant pandas are highly endangered. There are only 1,600 left in the wild. Now they will eat meat, but most of their diet is bamboo, which they have to eat at least 16 hours a day to get enough nutrition to survive. Once they're fully grown, they can weigh about 250 pounds. Red pandas are slightly larger than a house cat. They're also very endangered. This one is sleeping. <laughs> they are arboreal. They only come out of the trees to eat and drink. Since this part of Sichuan is now close to foreigners, we're going to have to take a train around to Gansu and try again to bicycle on the Tibetan Plateau. <clears throat> this whole area is considered part of the Tibetan Plateau, even though it's not technically inside the Tibet Autonomous Region. The lowest valley there, even at a high elevation. We're on a two-day train ride. The college students are now out of school, so we're traveling during the height of the tourist season. A lot of these people can sleep in amazing positions. <laughs> During Chinese New Year, 140 million people travel by train and bus back to where they were born to celebrate, celebrate with their families. This is the largest human migration in the world. The Yellow River is the second longest in China, but it's the muddiest river in the world. It's flooded almost a thousand times. Most people in this part of China are Muslim. Their religion, Islam, is the second largest in China. We would see the mosques dotted throughout the countryside. The people in this area were some of the friendliest we met in China. Another small town with incredible construction and skyscrapers being built. Although in the town was a great place to make photos. We liked the unusual scooters and the three-wheeled cars. The first privately owned car in China was in 1984. Before that, all the cars were owned by the government. We would often see a whole family come by on a motorcycle. The little, there's five people there. The little girl is sitting on the gas tank holding on to the mirrors. I had a group of very enthusiastic Muslim men surrounding me checking out my bicycle before each taking it for a test ride. <laughs> we try again to bicycle up onto the Tibetan Plateau. This time, the police don't stop us. After two days of cycling uphill, we finally see the summit. We still have a series of switchbacks the top was covered with thousands of Tibetan prayer flags. And there was an enthusiastic group of Han Chinese eager to make our photographs. <laughs> We're only like four feet from them. <laughs> then we look up on the hillside and see this, Tibet, this group of Tibetans and they waved us over. They offered us to they offered to share their food and their drink with us, so we spent almost an hour just relaxing and being in their company. But now we get to head back down the other side and out onto the Tibetan Plateau. One day as we were bicycling along, Tass stopped to make a photograph of some of these beautiful buttes. All, I should say all or most of the roads in China have very narrow concrete ditches beside the roads and Tass parked her bike along one of these ditches, walked over 
and so she was walking from the bright light into the shadow. She was looking at what she wanted to make a photo of, and she accidentally stepped into one of those concrete ditches, and she sliced her leg to the bone. Luckily, we're only about 10 miles from a nearby town, so we bicycled to the town, went to the hospital. The doctor is checking her out. He gave her seven stitches, a tetanus shot, a course of antibiotics. They cost 66 yuan, $9.16. We need to take a couple of days again off the bicycle. Luckily, we're in an area that we wanted to stop in anyway to see some of the beautiful Tibetan temples that are found here. We love all the bright colors. Lots of photos of the Dalai Lama. In some parts of China, it's illegal to have the photos, but here everybody seemed to have them out openly. Um, he is the leader, the spiritual leader today of the Tibetan people. For a long time, he was the political leader of the Tibetan exiles, but he's given up that position now. And uh, he is very highly honored throughout this part of China. In the Chinese government's view, the Tibetan Lama system was actually very similar to the Indian caste system where the monks spent the days meditating, but everybody else spent the days working like serfs to support the monastery. The Chinese Communist Party believes that they liberated Tibet from a feudalistic, economic, and political system. The Chinese government has spent billions of dollars bringing infrastructure into the Tibetan plateau. Um, back in the 1950s, the Tibetan mortality rate, for the infant mortality rate, was uh, 430 per 1,000. By the year 2000, it dropped down to 35 per 1,000. Most Tibetans we, we met were quick to acknowledge the improvements that have come about through the Chinese government, but they're also quick to say that they were really afraid that they were going to lose their cultural identity because of all the Han Chinese. Many of the small Tibetan towns that we visited now have the newer Han sections of town where thousands of people are moving in. We were in this area during a wonderful three-day celebration. There was singing and dancing all day long. The women did the slowest dance imaginable. And look at the jewelry that some of the women were wearing. These are all made of silver, and they're actually braided into the back of their hair. So it's all hanging from their hair. And look at the front. They have antique coral beads braided into their hair. Those beads are made of stone. They are also incredibly heavy. All the young girls are following behind the women. We thought this was one of the most amazing festivals that we have ever seen anywhere in the world. My bike computer says the temperature is 116 degrees. As we were breaking camp in the morning, a huge dust storm came in and created a very thick haze. We were very intrigued to see all of these unusual graves also scattered throughout the Gobi. You can see them also in the background. We're very excited to be reaching our final destination, the Singing Sand Dune Mountains. At the bottom are hundreds of Han Chinese tourists on camels, but we decided we wanted to get away from the crowd and we're going to climb the highest dune there in the back. The dunes got their name because when the hot wind blows across the sand, it creates kind of a humming sound. The tallest dune was about a thousand feet. It was very tricky and exhausting to climb. But because of the steep angle, the sand would quickly fill in our footprints and create these unusual patterns. From the top, we could see further into the Gobi, which we'd love to go back and spend longer and get even further into the desert. Because of the blowing wind, the dunes change shape constantly, and I liked photographing some of the patterns. As we descend the dune towards um, the a small oasis, I can't remember what it's called, Crescent Springs. Crescent Springs. 
we started reflecting back on the trip that we had taken. And we realized by working hard, by not ever giving up, even during those times when things were really hard, we ended up accomplishing our goals. And we were thrilled and excited by what we had experienced. I think one thing we love about traveling is getting to make friends in new countries and getting to experience their different cultures, traditions, and lifestyle. I hope this program will inspire you to learn more about China. It really is a fascinating part of our world.